Hi, Kyle. We're going to take a look at your aesthetics and control posting and give you a little bit of feedback. Also, the sun as key post as well. So, uh, kind of get into it, take a look at what we have here, make sure we got everything to hold out deep. And good, you label these for exposure. And you know better. Good. All right. Well, these four um, in these uh, in this experiment, these four components, they're really uh, they kind of go together um, in terms of the progress. You go start off with the shutter, and then you move to aperture, and then the third one with the exposure is really a combination of the two, where you're asked to sort of move uh, one and then uh, adjust the other to compensate. And then, of course, the you know better, what we're talking about here is uh, more or less taking advantage of all of the things that we've been working out in um, throughout the uh, semester. And they're just kind of exploring um, maybe an aesthetic that's that's closer to what um, you're interested in um, rather than just simply uh, performing exercises. So to hold, um, what we're getting into here is shutter speed. Now, a thousandth of a second, a half a second, those really don't mean anything. But once we start to see what the visuals are of those, um, we can start, we can maybe connect them to something. They'll mean something to us. Um, one of the things that sometimes can happen, however, uh, when we're doing like, for instance, a thousandth of a second, um, and I'm going to try to maybe find the ones that you did at a thousandth here. Um, this says a thousandth of a second. Um, and I'm thinking maybe these are not a thousandth of a second, because if that twig is moving at one thousandth of a second, that's speeding along super, super fast. So I'm going to guess that's not a thousandth of a second. Or you're doing something really crazy with the speed of that twig or something crazy with your camera or something. Because to be able to get that much blur at a thousandth of a second, that means you needed to be whipping around with that camera all over the place. And that twig must be flying through the air super, super fast. So um, that's probably not... Um, accurate in terms of the the um, uh, the the a thousandth of a second, or at least it doesn't seem like it would be accurate there. Um, we'll have to double check on that. Now you you can notice a, a little bit of something that, that's going on in uh, in some cases where the image is not just blurry from the movement, but a little bit soft in terms of focus, and that has more to do with um, you know, with the having to anticipate where things are. Um, when you're uh, making photographs where the shutter speed is fluctuating and you're capturing movement that your eyes can't ne necessarily see, or you're capturing movement of something that isn't in the frame yet, basically you're having to anticipate or pre-visualize what's going to happen. So where do you focus? How do you know where to focus in order to make sure that thing is sharp? Well, it's very difficult other than maybe measuring and trying to just kind of get the, you know, the mark just right or using a long depth of field, which we'll get to in a moment, but a long depth of field. Um, if you have a shallow depth of field, it falls off very quickly. And so you have very little to, um, you have very little forgiveness in terms of it being in focus or out of focus. So it goes out of focus very quickly. Plus you have a hard time <laughs> figuring out just where the object is going to be. So you have to take many, many photographs in order to find the, the real like moment that things are. So what we tend to do is these spaces down in here, the, the things that are not going to move, we will want to focus on those. We want to kind of begin the, the composition where we're critically focusing on those, knowing that, well, the other objects are going to be moving. Maybe they will be in the frame as if focused or not. We'll, we'll take our chances. I think you got the, the exposure just about right here. I mean, it's quite beautiful and luminous, and you have lots of kind of energy going on. Um, you, you've handled the, the composition fairly well with things you can't see. Choosing it, basically, is what you end up having to do. Um, this one even, um, although it's it's 
largely sort of soft. There's enough information in there uh, to to translate as a as a clean photo. This is sort of starting to get away from you, but you know, as a texture and abstraction, I think images like this can work. Um, it's a matter of what your intent overall. Um, is in the end. But exploring these kinds of things really just takes uh, a lot of repetition and a lot of um, um, sort of, you, you, you make the images and then you kind of take a look at what you're doing, not necessarily analyzing whether it's good or bad, but just whether it's a direction that seems to be a, a, a way you want to go. And then you try to explore as you as you move forward. The editing part of it where you're deciding what's good and what's not good, that comes later. When you're shooting, use the time. Just shoot during the entire time. When I when we offer up, you know, a whole class period or two sessions or whatever, the idea is to shoot the entire time. It's not a matter of shoot until you're done. <laughs> it's a matter of just shoot given all of the time that you have. And then later you're going to analyze all the photographs you made and pick out the ones that you don't, um, that, that, that you want to uh, choose. Um, so it's not a matter of you'll ever get done during class period. You always just continue to make photographs so that in the end you'll, you'll be choosing from uh, plenty of them. So anyway, um, let's move to the, um, to the aperture, which I was noticing here that it looks like you kind of presenting them in this strange sort of, uh, you were you were doing the, the two um, focal lengths, the two different lenses here, like uh, the regular lens or the wide lens. And then you're putting those two f-stops together here. So uh, this would be a normal or at least a, 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 a one kind of a lens. And then this one's a slightly, um, uh, closer in lens because it, it's kind of bringing you closer. This is wider and this is closer. So, and it's of the same um, f-stop. Um, and then this one's again backed up again, and then this one's closer, and then this one's backed up again, and this one's closer. And it's a little bit of a challenge because it's hard, hard for us to compare because we have to jump over. But you can see the phenomenon. It's just a matter of how you presented them. You can see that the thing is getting in focus. So it's you did the project correctly. You just kind of have them ordered in a way that's a little bit funky for us to be able to see the what's really going on. And that is the objects in the front and the objects in the back are slowly gaining detail as we go, because what's happening is the depth of field is increasing. It's getting from the critical point and it's getting more in focus forward and it's getting more in focus backward as we go. This is because the light basically has to be more ordered to go through the smaller apertures as you go. So you did the project correctly. It just was confusing at, at first because I thought, well, what's he doing here with the with the variety here? But that, no, that that's all just fine um, as far as how you how how you did it it's just a the presentation was a little bit um a little bit off you know with the apertures it, it really was just um i wanted you to 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 witness what was happening in the camera i also wanted you to be able to um to have a, have a visual of the difference between one f stop and in the next whole f stop what 5.6 and then eight, what is the difference between those two when we talk about depth of field? We can say those words over and over, depth of field, apertures, we can memorize the numbers, but until we start to connect them to a thing, there's no context. It's like knowing a word in your vocabulary, but not knowing what that word means. You know, having a, 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 a word and you're like, I know the word, but I have no idea what the word means. Um, that's the same thing as like knowing the f-stops, but you're not really sure what they mean. Um, hopefully what this exercise does is gives you this visual so you can picture five, six. What does that mean? Um, it means the size of a hole, but also it means a shallow depth of field. Huh, okay, so you start putting those together. That's the whole idea behind this. Um, the exposures, that was a challenge for you to, of course, um, move one and then the other. It's called the reciprocal relationship uh, of shutter versus um, aperture. And here, uh, you know, I think you're, you're, you're still doing pretty good with your um, compositions. Um, you're getting in there nice and close. Um, the the white balance on what you're doing here is a little off. It's it's pretty warm. 
Um, you may have wanted to correct that. It may have been deliberate that you want with a warm, but it does feel a little bit off, like a little too warm, like yellow. Um, but that aside, um, we have one and then two um, where we're trying to, to capture the same exposure. I think it's correct. You know, tripods help to, to keep things calibrated so you can make them look exactly um, alike. But the idea here is to help you to understand that if I move one of these um, settings one direction, I need to move the other one in the opposite direction. So as time gets longer, then the aperture can get smaller. So I can make that aperture smaller and gain depth of field that way, or the other way around. Um, if I go shorter with amount of time, then I need to open up, but that opening up will give me a shallow depth of field and so on. Um, so your lighting looks pretty good. You're, you're doing some short lighting here, which is kind of nice. We have some, you know, business back in here, which, you know, we want to start to, we want to really pay attention to that. You don't have it here. You don't have it here. But then here we have a little bit of that um, background information noise. Um, you kind of corrected it a little bit here where we don't have it. But we want to pay attention to those things. At the very least, know that, you um, your camera is going to include that. And so even if you can't see it in your viewfinder, starting to realize that the camera is going to have that because you may not have seen that um, in your viewfinder because your viewfinder may not necessarily be showing you the whole picture. Um, it may be cropping it just a little bit in, in terms of what you see. So starting to learn that, what, what, how much is it going to give me? It's going to give me this little bit of extra over there. Maybe I want to take care of that. Um, so that it doesn't show up that way. So in the you know better, um, this is this is a is a sandbox. I wanted you to really just kind of explore. Um, and you took the single object um, and kind of playing around with it a little bit. Um, I, I'm I'm curious as to to really what your um, you know what you're after here. Um, what is it that you are um, really interested in? What's important to you here? Um, what are you wanting the, the audience to, to really get out of these? What do you want? What are you trying to get out of these? What are you asking photography to do for you here? Um, I mean, I think this is an interesting intro. Um, it almost seems like we're doing some sort of a narrative here. Um, but, it, you know, I think there's so little going on that some variation in that light. Um, when you have something like this, where it's a single object like this, you're almost setting up like a monologue. Like think of it like a play with a single actor up there. You know, they're going to have variation in their tone and their the, their language and how they speak. And maybe they'll have a small gesture or something like that. But um, that's going to give variety to it. Well, your, your skull here isn't going to have that advantage of talking. So you'll have to give it that variety. And I think the light would have done 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 you a, a favor here. You're clearly you're moving around. Yes, you're moving into the um, uh, around the side of it and kind of exploring on the other side and doing some um, subtle movement um, things here. This has some potential here with the kind of spirit photography almost. Um, we have the ghost image kind of going on here. Um, however, I think you know, in terms of lighting, you know, this is a course on lighting and stuff like that, that really, uh, if you had explored more variety in the way that light was being, uh, it was interacting here, that you probably would have had um, just more variety, you would have had more going on. Um, but that said, in order to do that, we must be very clear as to what we're trying to communicate. Um, and while I think these are kind of really interesting um, beginnings, these are sort of like explorations, um, I, I think they could go somewhere. I think this idea of the, the single object and then using the movement to kind of activate it, we need to add something to it, like the, the, the kind of quality of light that's very, that, that has variations in it from image to image to have them feel more dynamic. Like time is changing or something is evolving over the period of, um, of, the, of the series. So let's move to your, um, your skylight or your sun, I'm sorry, your sun as um, key. Um, let's see, where are those here? Um, Kyle's got some light as key. All right. 
So this will be the transitionary kind of um, uh, uh, experiment where I just had you guys um, starting to get outside to apply the um, the, the the principles and some of the tool sets that we used um, in the studio to start to, I guess, apply it in a situation where you don't have all of the control. Uh, you use the skull again here, um, more of a uh, the, the, the sort of portrait uh, area where it's just sort of there. Again, I'm interested in knowing what it is about this that you're uh, wanting to communicate to us here. Um, I mean, you're 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 imposing um, something that is that has some, I guess, uh, it's it's a rather loaded um, bit of content. Unlike the random kind of nondescript bones that we're using as our still life material, those are you know fragments or or bits and parts and things like this. A human skull is is a whole nother kind of a thing. Um, there's a lot of metaphor and there's a lot of um, uh, kind of sub subtext to um, uh, presenting a, a, a human skull uh, as compared to just random animal bones or something like that, or using them for their texture. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in how you're uh, how how that's going to to, to work here. I I, I I see you're you're using a, a kind of a switch up here with the uh, white balance as well. Um, compositionally, we're working a bit with the rule of thirds here. Um, I think this is an interesting, um, as far as just composition, the breakup of space, um, that you're you're kind of using this as a as a low kind of angle. You've got lots of dynamic angles and line work going on to the background. Um, the skull is sort of inset, almost like submerged into the ground here. I think this one is really in terms of the 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 compositional weight of it seems to be have more. Um, uh, it seems more resolved than some of these others. You know, um, this one's this one's fairly well well seen as well. Um, well seen as well. This is this this one's uh, got got some structure to it as well. But it it has a geometry going on to it. You've got the the profile again, the rule of thirds line. You've got the the composition broken up into one, two, three here. Um, that's very effective. This, on the other hand, doesn't quite do that. I think, as you can see, it, you, you start to do it with the three pattern in the background, but the the leveling isn't quite right. Um, you found it here. Um, this one is probably the, the strongest of those. Um, this one is similar to this one in that it didn't quite um, get that graphic nature to it. These get a bit dark. Um, this one's more interesting. We could have had a little more room down at the bottom. We get a little bit of what might be considered like this car crash where there's this tremendous amount of tension right here that just pulls us down and away from it. We want to kind of avoid that. But in terms of capturing light into deep shade, that's pretty uh, a pretty good job. This just needed a little bit more luminosity and I think you could have pulled it off. Um, it got just slightly dark on you. Um, you probably could correct this in Photoshop, but I'm afraid that there wouldn't be any information back here once we started to, to brighten it up. But for window light, um, this is the kind of lighting that um, you may be using more often than, than you think. Um, in, in the commercial kind of world, you, you'll see professional photographers use um, studios that have massive windows. Um, because natural window light is such a, a useful and beautiful light to to, to work with. Um, I worked with it a lot for a long time when I was living in Savannah. I had a studio and I had huge windows in my studio. Um, I have a house. I bought it because of the windows. Uh, well, partly because of the windows. Window light is is to a photographer what you know quality paint is to um, to the painter um, and quality canvases. Um, we we want a, a certain type of light, and window light is is one of those things. And it also is free. Um, we don't have to have particularly expensive equipment, and we're using the lighting in the in the studio. We we want to learn on that so we can control and we can understand the. The, the principles and the, the characteristics of light, but we can incorporate those ideas into something as simple as the window and then just, just move ourselves around in order to 
adjust the, the, the compass. So if we, we need the, the compass at number four, we can move ourselves to position the window so it's at four in relationship to me and the, the subject matter. So that's an important thing. You chose this black box, which is a challenge. Um, I think your exposure got off here. It's too dark. Um, and and there, it, it's kind of like, I'm not sure what, what we're, uh, we're really trying to get here with three images pretty much just the same like this. I, I, I'm not sure if, if we had this issue with yours before. I can't remember if we, uh, if I, if I mentioned this to you, but the, the idea of the repetitive image, like something looking like the same photograph over and over, we don't necessarily need to have those in our postings. We can, I would rather you choose of the three of these, the one that seems to be the most effective and then have a different thing going on or maybe a different sort of perspective of this. Um, maybe it's lower or higher or a different composition or something else that's going on um, with it. The subtle variations that we have here are, are so close. I mean, they, they're, they're practically the same images. They really don't qualify as three different pictures, if you know what I mean. You kind of can see that. So um, that said, I think this one um, is probably the, the best of the, the three composition or three uh, exposures. Um, yeah, those that's the best one of the three comp, uh, exposures, um, mainly because you have whoops, um, mainly because you have the, the detail in the darkest areas are still coming out. It still reads as dark, um, but here the detail is starting to get away from you. And on here, it, it really did get away from you right here in the in the darkest um uh, the darkest portion of it. Um, this one, you're you're still getting the nature of of the the tone of the box, but it didn't quite um, fade away on you. So I think this one's light lighting wise is is right on target where you wanted it to be. So there you are. Um, that's what I have for you. Um, I think you got a lot of really good things going on here. Um, you just want to pay attention to the repetition, make sure we're not doing that. And really ask yourself as you're making photographs and you're making your art um, uh, moving forward, um, what is it that you're really looking at? What is it that you really want to communicate to your viewer? Uh, what are you asking of the medium? What are you asking photography to, to bring out um, for you? Because um, it is a, a conversation in a lot of ways when you're making the photographs um, between you and the medium to kind of work together to eke out the, the, the content there. So you'll want to ask yourselves those questions. So I will see you in the studio. I look forward to more photographs. All right. Bye now.